Hi everyone and welcome to our giant warm intro founder preparation session which we've opened up to the public so there may be lots of you who aren't participating um, in giant warm intro this year but we welcome you as well we've got an amazing lineup um, as far as the panel goes today we've got um, Lauren from AWS who Lauren Kaplan um, who is a startup guru has been in the ecosystem for a long time um, and is a fantastic person to get advice on startup pitching. Uh, we've got Rachel Newman, who uh, runs Flying Fox and is, if you didn't see, you should Google her because she was in Forbes yesterday and we're all very excited about that. <laughs> I, had to, I had to mention it. Um, and we've also got Jason Atkins, who is the co-founder of Cake and has been through the pitch process, the fundraising process. Um, so... We're going to have Lauren speak to you today about structuring your investor meeting. Um, Rachel's going to talk to the investor mindset. So it helps, I think it helps founders really understand um, how to pitch when they know what investors are really looking for and how they're thinking about things. Um, and we've got Jason, who's going to be talking about the fundraising process and some tips and tricks. Um, as we go through, please do ask questions in the chat. Um, I will try and get to them and feed them into the team um, as we go. So feel free to um, pop them in there. We're also recording the session uh, and we'll send that out to everyone uh, afterwards. So I think we're at 12.02. I think we will have most people have joined us now, so we might get started. So um, Lauren, we're going to start with you. Um, I know that when founders are... Uh, uh, getting ready to pitch. It can be a bit nerve wracking. You've got a really limited amount of time. You've got a pitch deck that's all set up. If, you know, you know the key points that you want to make. Um, I know that structuring your meeting can be really, really helpful. Do you want to give us, kick us off with um, some ideas that you have around how founders should really structure their meetings and approach their meetings? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And it's great to see so many people tuning into this session. Hopefully um, you're getting prepared for a great a uh, couple of, of meetings ahead of you over the next few weeks. Uh, but I think one thing I wanted to mention is, you know, it is important to focus on the meeting itself. But what I really wanted to encourage everyone to do first and foremost is actually zoom out from this concept of, you know, investor meetings and advisor meetings and that kind of one foot in front of the other kind of mechanism that happens when you're, uh, you know, a founder thinking about raising money or getting to those those next kind of smaller milestones in your journey. I really just wanted to, to encourage everyone to think bigger about what that overall objective is that they're focusing on first and foremost and let that kind of longer, longer range view actually Actually help inform how to get the most out of the individual meetings that you have because if we if we think about the meetings themselves we kind of apply the same brush to all of them and we just kind of run them like a format um, you know one after the other whereas if you have this overall objective in mind you start to get some nuance around how you might uh, leverage those opportunities and what you're looking to get out of each of those individual conversations you have so what's the what's the kind of longer term milestone or objective that you're focusing on and how can you use these opportunities to connect with different people across the ecosystem to to kind of create your plan as you go and, and kind of create a longer a longer term strategy for whether that be the fundraising or you know the specific business advice that, that you're looking after that you're looking for rather so once you have this kind of longer term view or objective in mind maybe pick a, a milestone like a six month kind of milestone where would you like to be in six months and then work backwards from that uh, to, to figure out how you might use those meetings I think the next really key thing to obviously consider is who are you actually meeting uh, you know what is it that you can actually uh, benefit from in having these conversations what do you need to make sure you get across in those meetings so uh, you know take the time to do some research about who those people are that you're meeting try to uncover cover you know what experience they have in the market whether it be in the, the kind of current role that they have and maybe you know the fund they work for or the or the startup they work for if it's more um, startup advice but also kind of dig back into their into their background you know what's their specialization what's their superpower what do you hear them talk about or write about in market that you could actually you know get that time to dive deeper on I think they're they're the most interesting and, and rich conversations when you can actually tap into somebody else's you know secret source or, or special expertise because they're pre prepared to to um, kind of share a little bit more about what lights them up as well. So make sure that that, that kind of research um, on the individuals forms part of your, of your preparation. Um, I think that that specific value add also then can help you tailor what is it that you need to share. Now, that might be consistent across everyone you meet. There are some key bullet points 
in your in your kind of uh, pitch or your story of your startup that you need to get across no matter what. But there also may be a, um, it may be worthwhile to actually tailor or shape um, what you get across based on the the expertise or the insights that that person might have. So, uh, you know, again, stepping back and and thinking, you know, out of this meeting, I at least need to share topic one, topic two, topic three, anything else is a bonus. Uh, but if this person understands these three things, then we're going to have a really kind of fruitful conversation off the back of that, um, rather than just treating yeah, every meeting as the same kind of template uh, and maybe missing that opportunity to go deeper on a specific, um, a specific topic. But having said that, you know, this meeting is in your control you are the person who should be managing the time and and the way the meeting is used so it's up to you to not spend you know 29 minutes sharing context and um you know the 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 backstory and the current status and the kind of where you think you're going um, of your business and only give them one minute to to respond without even really having a sense of what they're what they're able to contribute so use that that kind of 30 minutes as wisely as possible think about how much context you share um, but then also ensure that you're spending that time getting really clear on what it is you think you can get out of this meeting with this particular person or what are the meta things that you're looking to understand over the next, you know, three three months, six months, whatever that might be. Um, and so that you can actually give them, you know, some level of uh, a feeling that they can be as helpful as possible in that short period of time. Because, of course, we know 30 minutes goes super fast. Um, so you do really need to, to manage that time appropriately. Um, and maybe some final thoughts on on managing the meeting. I think it's it's often encouraged, you know, to ask the the advisor or the or the mentor to, um, you know, give you more introductions or what can they do for you. I think it's it's obviously valuable if you can leverage that opportunity to, you know, get more get more um, traction or other meetings or other engagements off the back of that. But I would encourage you also to think about how much work you're giving that person and how many other meetings like this they might be having. So wherever you can, it's like take the homework on yourself, take the notes. Um, if they give you a name, you know, think about how you might be able to reach that person without having to ask that that um, advisor for an introduction. I think it's about showing your proactivity um, rather than pushing pushing all of that work outwards. Um, and I think, you know, this this kind of final point I wanted to make, um, so many of these meetings end up being like, how can I raise funding? Who can you introduce me to? Who can give me money? Um, and I think it's it's always worth remembering that the, the key objective here is how do you build the best business possible? How do you build the strongest startup? And, and so questions that are focused around, you know, how can I strengthen engagement with my customers? How can I, you know, enter a new market how can i build the strongest kind of business model these will always be um more interesting to answer you'll always get better insights out of the investor or the the advisor i think as opposed to how do i raise this amount of money so that i can build my business you know if you keep that focus on building the business first and foremost um, i believe and i think you know rachel probably will agree and jace also in his experience um, you know, the money will follow where that that traction and momentum is. And if you, if you zero in on that and leverage the experience and expertise at your disposal to kind of push that forward, everything else kind of plays out as it should. So that's some really top line um, tips from me on how to approach um, these meetings that you're having, hopefully, you know, for Giant Mom Intro and, and any meeting after that mm. as well. Yeah, great. Thanks, Lauren. I think it's also important to know that um, a lot of these meetings will be kicking off a relationship. Um, and sometimes it takes, we've invested, Rampersand has invested in a founder who participated in Giant Warm Intro. And I think it was about 12 months after the initial meeting um, that that, you know, that ended up playing out um, into a, investing in their round. So, um, yeah, structuring those meetings is really important. Um, as Lauren said, I think not giving the investor homework, um, taking that on yourself and knowing that um, even through just one meeting, you, it's the start of a relationship. So how might you keep that going too? Um, a couple of questions I'm just going to answer really simply before we go on to Rachel. Um, so for the VC meeting, for those giant warm intro founders, um, if you have a co-founder and you want them to be on a call and they're not sitting with you, they'll need a link. So please email me. Um, and I will set you up with an airmeet link for that other person. Um, do you have a chance to research your matches before you pitch? Yes. Um, early next week, we'll send out those matches. Um, there's no changes, no swapsies. Um, so once we send them out, you can start researching them and, and find out who they are. 
Um, and that they're all the questions for now, I believe. Uh, will the matches have time to read the pitch deck? No, we don't send, not everyone um, submitted a pitch deck with their giant mom intro application. We don't send pitch decks ahead of time. So that'll be up to you um, to uh, bring that. And the only time that investors have dedicated to giant mom intro are those um, two hours. So there'll be um, their 30 minute meetings that investors have up to four and you guys will have two meetings. So two investors and you can pitch and bring up your pitch deck on the spot. Um, and I can you contact them prior? Um, I, I they, they've you know the time that they've said that they'll spend on Giant Warm Intro is the two hours, and they're really really you know obviously busy people. But it's up to you if you want to contact them before take that initiative. Um, so Rachel, investor mindset. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you think about things, how you see the world as an investor, um, and someone who sees a lot of pitches all the time, speaks to a lot of founders and makes a lot of investors. Um, how do you view the world? Yeah, thank you. And Lauren, thank you so much for teeing it up so beautifully. It's almost as if we choreographed this. Um, but first of all, Lauren, uh, I just want to reiterate some of those great points that she made about being really strategic about that time together and thinking about what are those two or three things that you want to make sure that you nail home. Sometimes investors might take you on a, you know, off on tangents and make sure that you are guiding us back to those most pertinent uh, messages. And so what I'll do is I'll share with you kind of what's going on inside our head and why, so that when you think about what do you want to get across, you should marry it up with what do investors care about and what are they looking for? And that might help you to tailor both those key points to get across as well as how to tailor that messages. Um, I'm going to go quickly through. I have a ton of slides, but I'm just going to zip through them, but I'll provide them um, to Sarah. And if people want it, she can share them. Um, so as Sarah said, I'm an investor, but before that I was uh, in operating roles. Um, so I know what it's like to try and build businesses. Uh, and now one of the founding partners of Flying Fox. And just to give you an idea of who we are, <clears throat> we have over $30 million of um, assets under management. We've invested in 52 companies just like yours. 38% um, of our capital happens to be behind uh, founders who are female. And we've co-invested with 25 um, wonderful investors like Rampersand uh, throughout Australia and around the world. Um, here's just a quick snapshot of our Flying Fox family. And maybe one day we could have some of your logos up on this page as well. The one thing I want to say before we go down this track is you need to remember that this whole thing is a choose your own adventure. Uh, and so investors, we all have very different tastes and investment theses and founders. There are lots of different ways to build wonderful businesses. Some of those pathways may include venture capital or funding from other methods. I just want you to know that no matter what path you choose, there is not uh, only one road that leads to success and success can look in lots of different ways for lots of different people. So we're going to talk about VC specific investing, and I'm going to tell you specifically what VC investors look for, but we are not the only show in town and each investor is different from firm to firm. So I just want you to remember that there's no one way to do this. I'll just share with you some of the way the ways in which I think about it. And in general, the ways VCs think about these opportunities. So uh, it's all about risk and return. Um, and so when we're looking at your companies, your beautiful, passionate, incredible companies, uh, we are there with you. It, you know, We feel those incredible opportunities, but when we zoom out, especially when we're managing other people's money, we're thinking about how risky is this? What kind of return? And then there is that balance. And so we're venture capital. And in many instances, if you guys are early angel investing, it's in the very high risk, but hopefully in the very high return category. So also, you need to know who you're talking to because it would not be a great idea to be talking to uh, a private equity style investor if you're super early because they have a very different risk profile, right? And so this is just to say, know who it is that you are talking to given the stage of your business. I want I took out a few other slides, but even within venture, there are lots of different firms. We invest in different stages. So it is... Uh, incumbent on you to think about and to do your, your homework on who are the right investors, either for your industry or for your stage and you know your round size and your check size. Let me just tell you a little bit about how we think. VC is a hit business. And these are four diagrams all saying the same thing, which is from many, 
there are a few that are going to do the work of the whole portfolio. And so if you look like in the bottom in Y Combinator, which is a leading accelerator of the US, 50% of the returns of that entire pro of the entire fund has just come from three companies. And then 75% of returns have come from 10 and less than 25% of returns have come from literally thousands of companies. So this is just to say that we often, one, we have a high risk tolerance. Not every company is going to make it. And we know that, but we also are looking for some companies that are going to blow it out of the water and are going to make up for all of those companies that don't make it. What this means is there are so many instances where we will meet great companies that we could see them being really solid businesses. But in, if, if in our minds, we don't see them being, you know, canvas or having that potential, then sometimes we have to pass. And it's not because you're not great. And it's not because you're not going to make a lot of money. And it's not because you're not building a great product for a really important pain point. It's that we need to build a portfolio that manages how much risk we're taking on. And we need to look for some of these companies that we think are addressing a huge problem in a huge addressable market and have the potential to be big. So again, thinking about what kind of company you're building or you want to build, that might start to inform who might be your right investors. But a lot of VCs kind of see the world through this lens. At Flying Fox, we're a little different. We have tolerance for a very valuable middle um, and kind of more modest exits, but VC in general follows, it's called Power's Law, and they tend to follow this kind of hits business. So let me tell you what we look for. So first of all, we meet companies lots of different ways. Um, sometimes we just get inbound. Sometimes we reach out when we hear about some great companies. We have great co-investors like the ones here who send us deals. And then, of course, we get to meet folks like you through the giant warm intro. And so... Um, Hopefully, this is a great experience for you to practice and to meet people, but we are always looking for great deals, and certainly some come through into programs, um, come through programs like this, so thank you for um, helping us to meet you. Um, this will just be kind of point two on the on the process. So after we meet you, we then obviously would go, if we like you, we'll go into a due diligence process and then a whole investment process. But uh, this simplifies it. It has four steps, but there is a lot of work that happens in the one and the two where we filter, you filter, we find that good match. And then number two can be many meetings, many times over for us to get to know each other. So just know that sometimes this can be a fast process. Sometimes it can be a slow process. Here are the six big chunks of things that we look for. And it's very easily distilled down into six T's. The team, are you a superstar founder and or the, your co-founders? TAM, which is the total addressable market. Is it large, growing, accessible, and strategic technology? Do you have some sort of disruptive technology or disruptive business model? Traction. And you could be pre-product and pre-revenue, but still have traction. How frequently are you shipping? What kind of experiments have you run with potential customers and you've learned from that? So we're looking at just show us proof of momentum. Trends, why now? What's happening in the macro market where all of a sudden consumer behavior makes this a really exciting time to investing in this space? And then the last one is terms, which is just kind of the deal. Does this make sense? How does this fit into my portfolio? As I mentioned before, is this the right price for this opportunity at this time? So this is a simplified version, but I would, you'd be surprised to know how often we just use this as a very basic framework for assessing an opportunity. At the end of the day, though, this is a study that was done with VCs around the world, and 40% of VCs responded that when forced to choose, are they backing the jockey or the horse? The jockey being the founder or the founding team, and the horse being the idea. And the earlier the company, the more often we're indexing on you guys, the founders. And that's because chances are the product you're going to bring us is going to be the like a real crappy version of what will eventually you know save the world. Chances are you'll you know pivot a bit, maybe even you know take your um, your product in a different direction. But what we're betting on is is this person the one who's going to be able to navigate uh, these waters, figure out what's working, and what's not, and more importantly, have the endurance to uh, kind of you know butt your head up against a brick wall for a few a few years of your life. So. I want you to think about this in terms of meeting us as well. There are great firms, there'll be, you know, great brands or, you know, very specific players in the industry, but this is going to be a marriage that statistically is going to outlast the average Australian marriage, eight to 10 years. So you want to make sure that you're finding the right investor 
likewise, we're making sure that we're making a bet on you. So at the end of the day, even with all this technology and ones and zeros, this really is a human business. Now with humans come a little bit of challenge and that is cognitive biases. These are many, I'm gonna read out each one. No, I'm kidding. Um, this is just to say we are human and we come with biases. You come with biases, so do we. Uh, good investors are actively trying to overcome these, but they exist. And this is why the Giant Worm intro is such a great opportunity for us to meet people that maybe we wouldn't have otherwise bumped into um, to hopefully overcome some of the, that selection bias. But just know that given that this is such a human endeavor, there are biases um, that are inherent uh, this is just acknowledging something that is tough. All right, so what to do to shine. This is one of my favorite slides. This is, you need to clearly articulate the customer problem that you are trying to solve, the pain point. Do not come explaining your solution because chances are you're early. Chances are you haven't built the solution. It's made, it's make-believe and chances are that solution is going to change a million times. Get us to fall in love with the customer problem. The customer problem will never change. How you tackle it, is something that will evolve, but tell us about the problem and tell us why it's so important. That is something that everyone can identify with. And people might say like, ah, I don't agree with your solution, but we can all get behind a problem that we think is real, substantial and large and growing in its market. So first and foremost, the clear articulation of the customer problem is going to get investors interested and compelled that you are operating in an important space. The second part is just kind of know your numbers. This is not to have metrics. Again, if you're pre-product, pre-revenue, this is not for you to be able to spit this out, but you should roughly know what are the metrics that matter in the type of business you're building. So if you're building a marketplace, you should know that that's usually about GMV and you are uh, you know, clipping the ticket and making money as a percentage of the total transaction that goes through. If you are a B2B SaaS company and selling subscriptions, then we're going to be thinking about the world of recurring revenue, annual recurring revenue. Um, if you're in a consumer product, then we're going to care about what is the cost to acquire our customers, so CAC, versus their lifetime value and understand what is that payback period. Again, you don't have to know these numbers, but the more that you understand what are the metrics that drive your business model and you're able to speak to that, it just gives us confidence that you understand how does your business work and what are those levers going to be that you can pull to change your business and to help it to grow. <clears throat> Here's a little sneak peek of everything that I asked. So if you get me, this is exactly what 30 minutes look like. And a good investor, we just like know 30 minutes in our body, in our bones. Like I know exactly when I'm hitting that 22 minute mark. And that's when I hand the mic over to you. And then in the last three minutes, we wrap up. Um, but this is what I ask. And this is what I'm looking for. And so this, I actually think is, um, it's a bit of a killer slide that I'm happy to share. Uh, but this is where we might ask a certain question, but what we're trying to get under the hood. So when someone asks you, tell me a little bit about yourself, we actually don't want to know that you grew up in a small town, you went to high school, you have 10 brothers and sisters, unless that's highly relevant to the company. What we actually just want to know is who are you, what makes you tick, and why do you care about this problem? So get to that pretty quickly. In particular, when I, I will ask, you can be working on anything, why this? I want to know why are you obsessed with this pain point? And do you have a direct and uh, proprietary uh, view of it. I might ask you, what are your customers doing today and why is it insufficient? What I'm really looking at is what are the current solutions in that competitive set and why is this different? Um, same thing with the next one. You know, How are you different from your competitors? I'm trying to understand what your value prop is. When I ask you, tell, you, tell me about the progress you've made to date, I want to see traction. I just want to see how is this a person who constantly is getting momentum in whatever she or he is working on? How big can this be? I want that to be a total addressable market. If you can quantify this, that is great. Um, tell me about co-founders. How do you divide and conquer? I'm looking for dynamics. And if you have a co-founder here, you should think about how you want to share that time that you have so that you can um, kind of display how you share roles and responsibilities. Um, when I ask thinking about the year ahead, what's keeping you up at night? I don't want you to tell me that this is without risk. I'm an early stage investor. There is risk everywhere. And there are going to be warts and pimples all over your, uh, your business. What I want to know is, are you cognizant of the risks? I want you to be able to say, this is what's going to be tough. 
this is what is risky. This is what is unknown. I love when founders say, I don't know, but here are the three ways that I'm going to try and get the answer to that. And so when we invest, it's not because you're free of risk and free of unknowns. It's because we have decided those are acceptable risks. And we believe that together we can help you get through that. So be really upfront around what you know and what your high conviction on, and then be really vulnerable to say, because we are doing this for the first time that no one else has done, these are the things that we're gonna figure out. And we have a very methodical plan for experimenting through that. Then I might ask you about the raise. I wanna understand um, you know, if you're raising capital, how much, if there are others involved, if there's a lead, and if there are any terms, don't be afraid to share that. Um, and that's important. You know, a lot of people try and hold their cards close to their chest, but we just want to know if this is something we should even entertain. I had a call with the founder today. She said, we're raising 2 million. Great. Perfect round size and valuation. She's thinking 30 million. Okay, great. At that point, we're out. We can end the conversation there, buy her a coffee and wish her well. And so don't be afraid to share some of these terms. Again, it's a matchmaking process and you want to make sure that you have the right investor in the right firm. Um, and then use of funds. Again, we just want to think about how are you thinking about what the next 12 to 18 months are going to look like? And have you thought about not just raising money, but what is the business that you're going to be growing in the next 18 months? So that is a very quick overview. The last slide is just a reminder to have fun. Uh, hopefully you're doing this because you're passionate about it, because this is your life's work, because you can think of nothing else but to wake up every day and to do it. And hopefully you enjoy getting to meet some folks on the other side of the air meet. Remember, we're here because we love this as well. We're looking to support incredible founders like you, uh, either with advice, but ideally with some money. Um, so I know that sometimes it can be stressful, especially if you're doing this for the first time, but please remember to have fun with it. Um, and good luck to everyone. That was great. Thanks, Rachel. There's actually a question that I might um, hand to you. Um, and it's from... Uh, it says a lot of VCs are sector agnostic, but when you start to talk about your B two C marketplace, they become skeptic, skeptical. Um, so, what would you say um, are some specifics if you have a B two C marketplace um, hmm. that that might help you have a conversation with an investor? Yeah, so you should look for investors that have a track record of investing in B two B marketplace, B two C marketplaces, and so that's just in general when you're doing your homework. You should look at who are the investors who like I think I can get on with and learn from, who have the network that I want, who, you know, invest in my type of round. But then look at their portfolio and say, are there other companies that look like me, not competitors, but that are the same business model? It will show one, that they have an appetite to invest in that business model. And two, it will show that they know how to invest in that business model. So in marketplaces specifically, that's all around building up both your supply and demand side, creating liquidity. That takes quite a bit of time and capital to do that. So you'll want investors who know how to invest in marketplaces. So looking for evidence of that, like um, actually a Startmate uh, guy once told me, we were talking about architecture and I said, oh, I want someone to build this kind of house. And he said, do you have evidence that she's ever built that house before? And I was like, oh, that's a good point. I guess she doesn't. And so that's a great uh, framework that I share with founders, look for evidence of where investors have invested in either that business model or that sector or that um, that stage before that not only shows that they want to invest there, but it shows ideally that they have some experience. Great. Thank you. A couple of other questions before we move on to Jason. Uh, Tracy, is it advised that you bring a uh, traditional pitch deck to your giant warm intro meeting um, or a one pager? What would you say, Rachel? No, I, I would, I prefer it to be conversational. Um, so instead you should think about that pitch deck. Ideally, when someone reads it, you want them to come away with two to three key points, as Lauren said. So be able to articulate that. And then like, I just had a great um, coffee chat today. And he brought a deck. I said, let's not talk about the deck. But then it was something that, you know, afterwards I was still interested and I told him to send it on over to me. Um, so maybe have that to be an artifact after afterwards, but 30 minutes is not a lot of time. It goes quickly. You want to build that rapport um, and you want to be very strategic with your time. If you get stuck in a page turn, 
I'll tell you what happens is once something's on a page, we can like drill down and like get stuck on something. And then 28 minutes has passed and we're on page two because an investor found one little number that we wanted to prosecute. Pull us out. Don't give us a doc. Give it to us afterwards as a, as a, either as a pre-read. I like, I like to have decks ahead of time, not for giant warm intro, but like when it's a real pitch, I like to have a deck because I want to be really informed and ask really smart questions or smarter. Uh, or then give me, uh, you know, something substantial afterwards. Um, but when we are together, let's have a human connection. And I'm also testing your ability to, you know, sell your your idea without the crutch of of a document. Mm. Mm. And I think when it comes down to those developing relationships, it's I would agree with Rachel. It's much easier to develop a relationship in a conversation rather than a presentation. Um, another question that I can answer, how are people paired through the program? That is a really good question. We try and pair you through a sector, you know, that, that the investor actually invests in the area that, that you're working in. However, there are so many, you know, I had 117 investors and you, you're 235 participating founders. And then I matched the ones I could um, and the rest sort of went to agnostic. But for example, we got heaps of medtech founders applying and not many people who are specifically med tech investors, uh, but they're great ideas. So you are matched with people who, uh, if they don't invest in your sector or your area, they will be able to give you some good advice and point you in the right direction. So I did the best I could with that matching and I tried to automate it, but it became very manual. So don't be too hard on me if you don't get the perfect investor. Um, okay, let me just check some of these other questions. Um, Rachel, do you have any particular points of advice for hardware startups at seed stage? Again, um, like we, we, we most often invest in B2B SaaS companies, but we do invest in hardware 10% of the time. And when we do it, we do it with a co-investor that has deep uh, expertise and deep pockets. So again, do your homework. When you look at investors, look at their portfolio, look at folks who have a track record for investing in hardware um, and then be prepared to talk about, uh, you know, the hardware. Um, and usually it, it requires more time and more capital to get to kind of um, the point of value. So just be able to talk to that, uh, be able to talk to your uniqueness in your technology and the capabilities within your team. But again, it always comes like almost every VC fund has a portfolio page. Scour that. Um, and look for their track record. Um, okay, there's some other questions here that I want to get to, but I will leave time for Jason. Don't worry. I think this is a good one. Um, what's a good framework when asking for dollars? So, um, you know, when uh, that that's a tough question to answer. I think, Rachel, what's what do you think? So we always, you I mean, um, like how much money you should be raising? Yeah. So she says, when you mentioned the scenario, I'm looking for two million for thirty for two million for a thirty mil val. Yeah. Um, what's a good framework to use when asking okay. for money uh, when so there, you don't have a valuation? Yeah. So there there are two ways, uh, two comments here. So first of all, in general, uh, sometimes the very first amount, especially if it's like a pre pre seed round or you know friends and family, it doesn't necessarily follow this. But the rough rule of thumb is each. Uh, price round, you are raising the money that represents about 20% of the company. So you get to just multiply it by five. So again, when this person was raising two with a 25 mil val, that's also it's like a small amount of money versus the val. Normally we would see 5 million raised on a uh, on a 20 mil pre-money pre valuation with a 25 mil post. And so usually just investors make it easy for us because we're not very smart. Like the numbers that tend to work, five on 20, 25, you know, one and a half, you know, seven mil, like they're just numbers that we're used to seeing. And so it's just weird when someone's only raising what is 10% of the company. So it either means the valuation's too high or they're not raising enough money. When we think about how much money to raise, what we want to know is how much money do you need to unlock the next big milestone to get you to the next raise or some important uh, you know, stage. And so we're roughly looking at 20, it used to be 18 to 24 months. Now we'd like 24 months of runway. So how much money do you need for the next two years that's going to get you from here to a step function change? 
And if that is 2 million, then that's how much you raise. And then your valuation is just two times five, right? Two times four would be your pre-money. And then that two on top becomes the valuation. And then we triangulate. Then we say, all right, other companies that are at this stage, are they around that valuation? Does that make sense? So you do some sense checking. Um, and that's where we are thinking about opportunity cost. But in the earliest stage, that's roughly how you should be thinking about it. The round should be about 20% of the total value of the company. And the amount you're raising should be about two years of runway for you to be able to do something significant in the metrics that matter for you most. Does that make yeah. sense? Hopefully it does. There's also a lot of, uh, I was just thinking of the resources out there. I'm, I'm going to start putting together sort of a resources pack for pre-seed founders that there's so many articles and so many investors um, create content based around these things. Um, so maybe we'll see that in the coming months when I get my act together. Um, so there are a couple of very specific questions. I might actually move on if that's okay, guys. And um, and because I we definitely want to hear from Jason because I think you're going to get a lot out of his journey. Um, he's been through this process um, and has some great stories. So uh, let's move on to Jason now. Um, and if your and if your questions are, are really burning and they're not answered, you can always sort of email them to me. I'll try and get to them before the end of the session. But I definitely don't want to run out of time. So Jason. Let's hand it over to you, fundraising tips and tricks for founders. Thank you. Um, great work, Lauren and Rach. Awesome information. If I do double up on anything, it's only to reiterate great points that have already been made, but I think my information is quite new. So I'm going to talk about the whole capital raising process. Um, and the objective of this information that I'm providing is to help you know cut the amount of time that it takes you to raise capital by maybe a half or something. I've been putting these tools together for five years. Um, these meetings are a great step on the journey, but they're only a step on your capital raising journey. Um, so yeah, I'm co-founder of Cake. Uh, we help startups manage their equity better. Um, so it's kind of the best place to run your employee equity or your ESOP and your capital raise and things like that. So we've got software for that. Uh, I've raised about five or six rounds uh, myself, not all for cake, but um, you know I've raised over $10 million and um, Rampersand is one of our lead investors. So um, thanks Rampersand, awesome people and definitely try and hit them up uh, when you get a chance. If they're aligned, of course, do your homework. Um, I've pitched almost every angel in the country and VC. Uh, and look, I think having, a, having fun and having a sense of humor was a great bit of advice. You know, if you're innovative, and you're really innovating, it's hard to convince people that you can do it, you know, especially in that first year. So you have to keep pitching, keep learning, you know, really have belief and, and conviction and perseverance and, and you absolutely can do it. I used to have this little saying that I would say, say to myself when I'd be, you know, running around Sydney pitching, I'll be like, validate me, validate me, you know, because it just felt constantly like you were trying to work out where the hell you were going to fit in this big, bad world, um, you know, while you're trying to take on incumbents and, and change the world. But look, do persevere. It is a, a great journey, but a sense of humor is probably important. And um, look, then we ended up with possibly the world's most famous uh, angel investor, Jason Calacanis, investing cake, and, and you know, now we're off and firing. So, um, look, we have learned from the best, uh, like Airtree and Startmate. So do your learning. Um, and yeah, look, we've only got a very short amount of time today. So I'm going to focus on, on these tools that I made. Check these out. I'm just going to share my screen. Cool. So I don't know if you can see that. So this is... Um, an example of one of our partner pages at Cake. I'm using Rampersand as an example, but there's tons of these out there. So if you've got, um, if you're in an accelerator, an incubator, or if you've got a lawyer or account in Australia, you've probably got one of these. You can access a discount code. In here, um, you can access a bunch of different resources, but what I'm gonna focus on today is this equity toolkit, because it has a bunch of capital raising um, tools and information in it. So to get started, um, let's go down to, so just quickly, you've got an options planning template and investor CRM that I'm going to show you in a minute. You've got some information here about the key legal templates for issuing equity to your team. You've got a, a startup valuation template. You've got um, capital raising legal agreement information. 
you've got a dilution calculator and the capital raising toolkit. So I've been putting these um, tools together for years. And the reason I did that was because I would be mentoring for an hour and just dominating with all this information. I thought, oh, there's absolutely no way you can retain that amount of information. So we put it into these tools that you can take away. So I'm just gonna actually put this link in the chat for you. I highly recommend um, jumping on and checking these out. So from a capital raising perspective, um, there's this raise hacks section here. So each of these is just a notion. This is open. You can make a copy and edit it yourself. So there's a section here about simplifying everything. Um, you know, why are you awesome? Uh, so important that you can, you know, what's awesome about you. Is it your conviction? Is it your insights? Is it, you know, what is it about you that's amazing? And if you're not pitching with that power, you need to go away and learn how to pitch with that power, um, get some coaching, get some advisors to help you really believe in your superpower and you have to pitch like that. Otherwise it's so, so hard. You know, there's stuff in here about finding investors. Uh, in Australia, it's not too hard because you've got the Edcre list, which is just like a wonderful way to fill the top of your funnel up. Uh, and of course, you know, programs like, like Giant Warm Intro, be a line, not a dot. Like, you know, you can't expect investors to invest in you the first time they meet you. So look, I won't go through all of those, but there's a bunch of tips there that really help reduce the amount of time that it takes to raise. There's actually a step-by-step -step guide here. I don't know ex exactly which one of the legends I, I stole this from. I think this one might have been Cheryl. Um, but, you know, so I've been learning from the likes of Lauren and, and Cheryl Mack and Mick Lubinskis and, you know, all the, you know, tons of the great leaders of our ecosystem and putting this together. So here you've got a step-by-step -step guide, you know, preparing your cap table, short pitch deck, long pitch deck, data room. Um, you know, how to build your investor relationships. What's the marketing phase look like? You know, how do you run the marketing phase and how do you run the closing phase? So there's a whole step-by-step -step guide there that you can you can go through. Um, there's, as I've said, there's information on valuations, pitching, data room checklist, all that stuff. So please do check that out. Going back a step to this toolkit, I really want to dig into the investor CRM template. Probably the biggest mistake I see founders making is raising capital before they have enough investors. There's a little video here kind of explaining it, but you're going to get a little firsthand explanation. So this is a tool that I got from uh, Mick uh, from Climate Salad now, um, just to help you understand how to run the investor CRM side of things and qualify investors. So just to you know quickly run through this, your investor names go here in column A. And to find out what investors you, you know, you want, you just go over here, um, I think choosing your investors. Um, there's some information on that. I think there's another page here that takes you to the Airtree um, Explorer list. So just go on there. It tells you what niche they invest in, what stage they invest in. You don't, it's not rocket science. And then you just go over here and you put them all in this column. And then you put in column C here, what their normal check size is, say for pre-seed or seed. And you're aiming to have 10 times however much money you want to raise in this column before, you know, as a starting point. Because if you don't have enough investors at the top of the funnel, you'll just find it difficult to create enough energy throughout your round to be successful. So your job then between 10 times and three times is to qualify investors. And so this is not, you know, don't meaning any disrespect. It's just making sure that, you know, they're interested in you. So that your job there is essentially to meet with them, share the deck, have a coffee, as Rachel said, and find out, do they invest in your niche? Are they investing this year? You know, would they like to see your round when you open it? You don't want to have an open round before you have enough investors that are aware of you. That way, when you open your round, if you've got three times capital already in this, um, three times the capital you need already in this column D, it's much more likely that your round is going to be successful. There's going to be more speed. There's going to be more, it's going to be more dynamic. Some of the investors are going to progress quickly and that allows you to keep momentum with the other investors and, and the whole capital raise goes so much more quickly. So the key things to learn here is, you know, 10 times the capital at the top of the funnel and that's quite cold. Then you have three times the amount of capital in column D when you open your round and that's warm. So you've met, there's interest. You might be doing monthly updates with them. You might've had several coffees, but they've definitely said to you, hey, look, when you open your round, I'd be happy to check it out and meet with you. Um, 
So I've got about another minute or two. I'll just show you another tool here that might help you along the way. Um, startup valuations is something that people quite often struggle with. Um, so I've got a little explanation here of four different valuation types. We've talked a little bit about valuations already, how, how you sort of set them for your round. You don't necessarily have to set the valuation yourself, but you should have done some of the homework so you roughly know where you're going to fit. So there's more and more information out there about what's going on in the market um, through you know, things like PitchBook uh, and other platforms, um, Crunchbase and things like that. Um, but it's also probably worthwhile using, you know, using something like this to work out what your company's worth. There's also a spreadsheet version here that we've made. So you could, for example, use the Berkus method. Uh, you could use the revenue multiplier method, et cetera, et cetera, and do a weighted average. Now, as Rachel said, look, it's not an exact science by any stretch, but going through this process, having a, you know, an intelligent way to analyze and discuss it, talking a bit to your advisors and your investors, and then when you go out to raise, you'll just be in a much better situation to articulate what you think you're worth and why, and you can have you know, a good conversation about that, which is, which is a big part of it. So current revenue multiplier is more for sort of series A plus, that's the one you always hear about, 10 times revenue, things like that. Uh, it does come down into seed stage a little bit, but it is sort of a later stage valuation method. Um, valuation by stage is probably the most common method for very early stage, kind of where are you roughly, idea stage, MVP, do you have a good bit of revenue, is it, are you growing? Investors will normally you know, put a pretty quick um, valuation on you based on your pitch because they see a lot of pitches. And then the Berkus method for that idea stage, that accelerator stage where you multiply each of those factors out by 500,000, add it all together, you end up with a valuation between 1 million and, and 2.5 and million or thereabouts. So um, yeah, so I guess there, um, I'll just sh stop, stop sharing. So, you know, my role was to talk about the whole raise. So there you've got sort of um, a capital raising checklist and you've got a data room checklist, you've got a valuation methodology, you've got a CRM checklist. So there's a bunch of tools there and hopefully they can, you know, really help you on your capital raising journey. Amazing. Like that is those resources are, are really amazing. So there are so many resources throughout the ecosystem, but it is about sort of wading through and, and finding the right ones for you. There's a question here that, Jason, I think I'm going to throw to you because um, you would have experienced this. And um, I hear about this a lot and see it a lot and have my own opinion, but I want to know what you think, Jason. So the question is from Jay. It says, one of the challenges we found in engaging with some VCs is that the first meeting is with a junior analyst who wants to challenge a concept or how a customer thinks. However, some of the questions that are asked indicate there's a lack of knowledge from the analyst who's asking. What is the best way to get better traction with these kinds of analysts? Uh, so I think this has been mentioned previously, but the capital raising process is a matching process. So I feel like if you're talking to someone and they absolutely do not get what you're saying, you're probably going to find it hard to ever change their mind. So um, that possibly means that that VC is not looking at your vertical or, or your space right now and that they're just not doing any research. If you're pitching and they're just not understanding you at all, it's probably an indicator that they're unlikely to invest. Uh, now they're going to be looking, the, the analyst is going to be looking at the same thing, whatever the partner wants to be investing in, they're going to be saying, hey, go do research in this area. So that if you're meeting with them and it's just clanging, uh, you know, I would advocate, um, you know, trying to find investors that believe in you, what you're doing and believe in your industry and your niche. And you're probably going to have, you know, a much better time. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a great, um, a great recommendation there. Um, let me see if there's some other questions here. I saw another one saying, when are you going to meet the, when do the giant warm intro participants get to know who they're matched with? It's early next week. I'll send an email out early next week. You can see those names up there. Um, I also wanted to include here a link um, that I've put in the chat to Abby's, uh, who's one of our investors here at Grand Percent. Um, he writes a really, really great blog called Superfluid. Um, and he put he wrote an article about the art of crafting your startup story. So I know a few of the, you will be pulling pitch decks together or refining pitch decks or, or trying to understand what story you're going to tell um, next week or when meeting with investors on the whole. Um, that We've had great feedback on that um, uh, blog post by Abby that talks about that. Um, so a couple of other questions before we start to wrap it up. Um, 
Okay, one says, are there any general bugbears or turnoffs for these VC meetings? Good question. Good question. Who wants to take that one? I think Rachel wants to take it. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'll jump in. Um, all right. So bugbear. So I had, I don't want you to give me this perfect shiny ver version of make believe, especially if something is not built. So the first bugbear, uh, and it happened this morning when someone's like, it does this, it does this, it does this. And I was like, cool. Is it built? And they're like, no. And I was like, okay. So I would much rather someone pitch it as, here are the problems that we need to solve. And we're envisioning envisioning a tool or a platform that will be able to do this and this and this. This is how we're thinking about it. And right now, this is what's built or these are the tests we run to prove that we're heading in the right direction. So I, it, it's always like an awkward time when you've spent 20 minutes explaining this like grand product vision as if, like love the confidence, but I'd actually rather know like what is built right now what is it trying to solve? Then, so that's bugbear number one. And bugbear number two is when you have like an answer for everything. Um, that's, that's not- what I was gonna say. Oh, I uh, stole it. All right, so you go. Oh, you no, me. not at all. Like it's so good. Like just not having humility and just like being a know-it-all and, and not being sort of yeah. coachable and, and having that iterative sort of curious mindset. I think that's, for me, I think that's what investors like. Yeah. It's like we the most- <laughs> Yeah. And like, we want to, I don't, sparring's not, we're like, we want to unpack something with you. Right. And like get into it. And um, if you're doing something to which you have every answer, then it's probably not innovative or it's probably not novel or difference making enough that customers are going to pay for it over what the current solution is. So yeah, I had mentioned it earlier, but I love when people say, I don't know, or I love when someone says, this is my hypothesis that I want to test. Like, do you have any thoughts on this? Or have you seen anything, right? Like make it a conversation. We are not here to try, like I got your moments and I saw there was a Q and A, a question that came through around like, um, like adversarial VCs. If they're like that, like just leave them. There, there are plenty of us. Find someone um, who's more of your style. But I know when I sit down with a founder, I'm not looking for gotcha moments. I'm like genuinely curious. And either you have the answer or a hypothesis, or I have no idea, or I have no idea, do you? And then there's something we can do together. So just like, yeah, just bring it all down a few notches. Related to that, it's it's not, it's just maybe a personal bugbear, but I think, you know, language really matters. And it's very easy to be extremely hand wavy, especially when you don't, you know, you don't even know the detail of what you're trying to do. So there's a lot of this, like, we're doing this to change the world, or like big hyperbolic statements um, that that don't actually get to the, the core of what matters. They don't get to the problem. They just speak about, you know, in broad terms, the impact you're going to have. Um, I think it's it's really worth, it, it comes with practice. Once you've said, you know, you might say it a few times before you realize it's, it's not giving you the impact that you want. So spending some time to really refine um, something much more specific and grounded in reality while also being able to paint a picture of where you think this is going. Those are the magic moments in a pitch for me when a founder can do that. That's great. Thanks for the advice, everyone. I have one last question that I just want to put out there. It's not, it's, I see it every day, all the time. Um, and it's a question about how many um, safe versus price rounds are you seeing? It's probably good for Rachel. Just safe versus price rounds. Give us the sort of overview. Yeah, um, I put a little answer in the chat. So first of all, a safe, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's kind of an IOU that's saying we're going to give you the money, but we don't know what the denominator is. We don't know what the valuation is. We just know how much money we're giving you. And in the future, when we do a price round and we put um, a value on this company, then our shares will be created, ideally with a discount or with a maximum valuation that that could have. It's kind of like uh, you get a coupon in the future, but you don't know what the price of that future thing is going to be. It's great if you are super early, there's like no way to put a valuation on this thing, or if you're in a bridging round and it doesn't benefit anyone, you or the investors to put a valuation on it. So you're saying, let's just kick this conversation down the road, give you some money, off you go. Um, so it's a, the benefit is that it's much more lightweight. It is cheaper from a legal perspective to execute um, and you don't have to put a value on your company. The downside is that it doesn't make your investor shareholders. And so there are certain rights and benefits that shareholders have that they don't have until that safe converts into shares. And one of the things I commented on was ESSEC, which is a tax benefit for investing in early stage companies. And many of us, if it's there, would like to 
uh, realize that benefit and we can't, if it's on a safe, it has to convert into equity. We have to hold those dirty shares in order for us to have that tax benefit. So um, depending on some of those things, investors might say, hey, let's go quick and dirty, get a safe, or actually let's do a price round. Um, also, if companies have too many safes that are stacking and it's just getting gnarly, we'll just say, let's do a price round so we can clean up the cap table in cake and convert it. So there's not materially that much difference. So right now, what are we seeing? We're seeing both. So for our bridging rounds, for our existing companies, we're seeing a lot of safes because again, we're like, let's not put a value on this thing. Let's just get you some money and get you where you need to go uh, a little more confidently. Um, but when we come in on those first rounds, they are often price, priced. Um, and right now, you should know that they are priced about 30% lower than they would have in 2021. Um, and those price rounds, uh, just so we have mindset uh, share that they are a little bit more favorable uh, in the investors um, camp right now, just slightly lower valuations. That's it. Amazing. Thanks. There was some feedback there that said that's got to be the best summary of safe IOU plus coupon. So that's, yeah, great way to explain it. Thank you, Rachel. So I'm going to wrap it up so everyone can get back to their startups and their lives and preparing for their next investor meetings. Um, if you have any questions about Giant Mom Intro, email me. Uh, my email, my inbox is full right now, just in the middle of an event. So it might take me a few days to get back to you. But um, again, if you have a co-founder who you would like to be on the meeting with you, just send me a little um, email with their email address and I'll, I'll get them their own link. Um, and otherwise, we will send out those matches early next week. Please don't change them if you don't have to. <laughs> it's a, it is a, 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 a huge task. So we would love everyone just to accept the matches that they do have, um, even if they're not perfectly sector matched. Um, so that's all from, thank you guys. That's all from us today. Thanks, Jason, Lauren, and Rachel uh, for all of those insights. A really incredible caliber of people. So thanks so much for participating in Giant Warm Intro. And uh, we hope to see you guys all next week. Thanks, Sarah. Good luck, everyone. Thanks. Bye. See ya. Thanks, everyone.